1941. Since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. But before the ruins of Pearl Harbor had stopped smoldering, Japanese aircraft attacked American forces in the Philippine Islands. Bombs from enemy planes had finally brought national unity. In charge of army forces in the Far East was General Douglas MacArthur. An American steeped in the history and culture of the islands, MacArthur consulted with his friend Philippine President Manuel Kazan. Together, they managed to delay the inevitable Japanese advance. The cost was enormous at Clark Field. Half our total bombing force was destroyed on the ground. But this didn't stop the Far East Air Force from wiring its planes together on emergency fields to fight what was destined to be a losing battle. Never knowing if their temporary bases would be safe to return to, fighter pilots engaged the enemy. The few B-17s that escaped destruction joined the fight. One, under the command of Captain Colin Kelly, was directed to locate and sink a Japanese aircraft carrier. Instead, they spotted a heavy cruiser. As Colonel Billy Mitchell had shown almost 20 years earlier, surface ships were virtually defenseless against surprise attack from the air. Kelly's bombs stopped the warship dead in the water. Kelly died in action later that morning, a hero nearly forgotten in the race to war. The Japanese finally drove the Allies out of the Philippines. MacArthur and what remained of our Pacific Air Force retreated to Australia. There had been a few of us Americans in the war, even before Pearl Harbor. We were working for retired General Claire Chennault, special advisor for the Chinese Air Force. Our P-40 Tomahawk squadrons trained secretly in Burma. We painted our birds up with gritted teeth and called ourselves the Flying Tigers. Most of us were army, but 
we had a few Navy and Marine pilots along for the ride. We got paid $600 a month and a $500 bonus for every Japanese plane destroyed. A few days after Pearl Harbor, the Flying Tigers' 1st and 2nd Squadrons moved to Kunming along the Burma Road. There, Chenault set up a fighter control headquarters and hooked into an elaborate air warning network of Chinese aircraft spotters. The Japanese, based 60 miles away at Hanoi, headed for Kunming to destroy the Tigers. The moment the Japanese flight was airborne, word was being flashed to Chenault and the Flying Tigers that they would soon be under attack. Isolated spotters used lanterns on hilltops to pass the signal along. This was the decisive moment. We weren't going to lose any planes on the ground. Kung Ming wasn't going to be another Pearl Harbor or Clark Field. The Japanese were about to feel the bite of our razor-teethed tiger sharks. Japanese lost 60% of their force in this one fight, and they never again tried to bomb Kung Ming. The 84 Flying Tigers were our only fighting airmen in China, and the only fully engaged American combat air force in the war. And like the Lafayette Escadrille who fought with the French in World War I, the Flying Tigers' small victories sent big messages. The first was that the Americans and the world were not going to give up without a fight. The second was that global war required men, thousands of skilled men. The lives of the crew were going to depend on the accuracy of the gunner. Behind each gun was a man. Behind each man was months of training. Gunners practiced with machine guns mounted on platforms and trucks. The Axis had 10 years to build their air forces. America had to do it in one, and at the same time, hold off an aggressive enemy. That's where American industry doubled and quadrupled its war effort. There was definite hope for victory, provided the British and Russian people could give the United States time to supply our allies and time to build an air force. It wasn't long and the Truman Committee was able to state, we have succeeded in building up an air industry in the US, which our foes cannot hope to equal. But planes alone were not enough. The amazing success of the Germans had awakened belated American interest in vertical envelopment, which is the landing of an airborne combat force behind enemy lines. There was nothing new about an airborne army. Billy Mitchell had received approval for such an operation during World War I, but even he never dreamed of entire armies filling the skies. Specialized training began in 1942 to create an army of flying foot soldiers, the 82nd Airborne. A tactical exercise in North Carolina tested their abilities. The paratroopers dropped on surprise defenders and seized bridgeheads. Following close on their heels were waves of silent gliders towed by cargo planes and released within range of their target. These sky trains, as they were called, enabled the army to bring hundreds of men and their equipment to battle zones behind the lines without exposing them to the risk of a parachute drop. The transport towed the gliders into position for the takeoff run.
This made room for another Skytrain, then another, and another. Departing on split-second schedules, the C-47s were like locomotives taking on freight cars. The airfields, like busy freight yards. Taxiing at full throttle, the tow planes could barely lift their ton and a half cabooses. They labored hundreds of miles until, over the drop zone, the glider pilots cut their ships loose. Banking sharply, the unarmed gliders avoided enemy fire by diving for the ground. As more cut loose and headed down to the spinning earth, the glider army joined the paratroopers. Thus, the AAF gave the infantry wings, and the weapon, vertical envelopment, became a reality. Whatever the capability of fighters in the field, there is no hope for victory without a steady supply of men and machines. At the time, America had the best commercial air transportation in the world. Almost immediately after the outbreak of World War II, the War Department contracted with airlines to ferry men and supplies quickly across the ocean. The ferrying service was reorganized as the Air Transport Command under veteran flyer General Harold George. By summer, ATC routes touched all six continents. The growth of the Air Transport Command closely paralleled the expansion of the Air Force itself. In less than two years, sky bridges connected practically every corner of the world. ATC sky wagons guided by the Army Airways communication system crossed the Pacific on the average of one every hour and a half, the Atlantic every 13 minutes. We needed a break. The Philippines had fallen. Americans had been humiliated and tortured on Bataan. The Nazis were running wild all over Europe and North Africa. We needed something to give a boost to the folks back home. A submarine officer proposed a plan to strike back at the Japanese, and Colonel Jimmy Doolittle was handed the task of figuring out if it could be done. Doolittle figured and said it could. It was an idea so daring, so beyond anything anyone had tried before, that the Army took it to the White House for approval. The President listened quietly, thought about what was being proposed, and gave a one-word answer. Go. It had never been done before. Launching fully loaded medium bombers from the deck of an aircraft carrier. It was the intent of the Doolittle Raiders to launch an attack on Tokyo. The 16 B-25s on the aircraft carrier Hornet had a rough voyage on their way to the takeoff point, 450 miles from Japan. While under destroyer escort, the 80 Tokyo Raiders held a deck ceremony with Japanese medals. Doolittle fastened one of these to a 500-pound bomb. The medals were going to be returned with interest. Before reaching their takeoff spot, the task force ran into a Japanese ship. The carrier's escort promptly sank the patrol boat, but there was no way of knowing whether it had radioed the American fleet's existence to other vessels. Since secrecy had been compromised, Doolittle ordered the planes to be launched. They were nearly 700 miles from Tokyo, instead of the planned 450. As they prepared for takeoff, the Raiders knew even their heavily modified bombers didn't have the range to return to the carrier. In spite of the last second change, preparations went just as we'd rehearsed. Doolittle had only 467 feet of clear deck for his takeoff. Behind him, the rest barely had room to rev up, and the last plane hung precariously out over the stern of the Hornet. After the wind-up by the plane officer, Doolittle made his run. He got up with 100 feet to spare. <laughs> Tension eased a little once the colonel was in the air. Crewmen cheered as one plane after another left the pitching deck. The 
Bombers were flying practically unarmed to lighten the load and give them extra range. When the decks of the flagship were cleared, Admiral Bull Halsey, the flag officer of the task force, signaled to the Tokyo Raiders, good luck and God bless you. The Japanese patrol had indeed warned the city, but the attack was expected the next day. The Japanese assumed the Americans would wait until the carrier was within safe round-trip distance for its airplanes. The bombers were virtually unopposed as they swept in over the coast on their way to Tokyo. Elements separated, and some climbed to 1,500 feet for the bombing. When Doolittle's planes appeared over Tokyo, the city had just completed an air raid drill. At 12.15, the attack was opened by Doolittle, who dove in before he dropped his payload. One after another, they checked off their targets. Tank factories, shipyard docks, railroad yards, steel plants, gunpowder factories. The Raiders were only over Tokyo for six minutes but they left a broad trail of flame and smoke in their wake. The military effect of the raid was minimal, the physical damage repaired in a few days. But Japan had had its first taste of war on its own soil, and it rattled them. They were no longer immune to the war they had started. They were no longer immortal. We'd given them something to cheer about back home. We Army Air Force Flyers had done the job, but we didn't get much of a chance to be heroes. All of us Doolittle Raiders crash landed in China. Some of them died. But most of us made it back to fight again. Doolittle himself returned and promised that our raid was just an omen of the eventual destruction to be heaped on Japan from the skies. During the critical early days of World War II, the Navy broke the Japanese secret code. The intelligence that code provided proved invaluable throughout the war, but never more than it did on May 15, 1942. On that day, Navy intelligence officers intercepted the detailed Japanese plan to attack Midway Island in the North Pacific, as well as points in the Aleutians off the coast of Alaska. There was no way to tell if the Japanese knew their code had been broken. If they did, the whole transmission could have been nothing but a setup. That would be the end of the already tattered U.S. Pacific Fleet. But if the transmission was legitimate, if the Japanese really were planning a move in the North Pacific, heading off that attack could be a turning point in the war. The Army and Navy decided to gamble, to try and intercept the Japanese fleet at Midway. The Air Transport Command delivered reinforcements, bombs and ammunition to the Aleutians and B-17s to Midway. We knew every last plane would be needed for the battle. After the long flight to Midway, with no rest, our crews went immediately on patrol. A Navy Catalina spotted the Japanese fleet, more than 80 warships, as advertised. The coded message was authentic, and we knew we were in for a fight. The Japanese task force divided. Some steamed north toward Alaska but the main body headed for Midway. 470 miles west of the island, the battle stage was set. The B-17s and B-26s sent to the island were fitted with extra gas tanks to increase their range. This was going to be the first test of B-17s as a defensive weapon against attacking surface forces. The battle started on the 4th of June.
Nine B-17 crews under Colonel Sweeney were joined by five from Colonel Alex Byrne. Warmed up and ready for battle, the bombers took off to hunt the enemy. A hundred miles out, our bomber commanders received orders to change course. An enemy carrier force had broken away from the main fleet and was launching an attack against our base. Our B-17s were sent to get them. The Japanese dagger pointed at Midway was made up of four carriers and supporting ships, including battleships, destroyers, and transports. The mission of the Imperial carrier planes was to destroy the island's defenses in preparation for an invasion. Marine Vindicators sprang to meet the enemy and the battle was on. Early on, the Japanese did pretty well. It was a free-for-all. And if there was one thing the Japanese fleet knew how to do, it was attack an island base. But this was no Pearl Harbor. This time, we were ready for them. Units of the U.S. Navy, including three carriers, raced up to Midway. The Navy fighters and bombers went after enemy destroyers and cruisers. The AAF bombers went after Japanese carriers. First, our bombers attacked from 3,600 feet. We got the enemy ships cross-firing at each other. During the three-day battle, Japan lost four carriers, two heavy cruisers, three destroyers, eight artillery vessels, 275 aircraft, and 4,800 men. We had smashed the Japanese dagger. Back at the base, free from the threat of amphibious invasion, the men dug themselves out of the wreckage. A Navy PBY, which had rescued a ditched B-17 crew, now brought them home. The battle ended with Midway's installations, including the hospital, badly damaged by enemy bombers. Marines and airmen who had fought side by side took time out to salute the 92 officers and 215 enlisted men the U.S. had lost. In what was perhaps the most important single engagement of the Pacific Naval War, the airplane proved itself as a defensive weapon against attacking surface forces. The Japanese had suffered their first real defeat. On the other side of the world, in the Atlantic Ocean, air power was about to have to prove itself once again, this time against a navy of subsurface killers. The Nazis planned to infest the Atlantic Ocean with submarines. Remembering how their U-boats in 1917 had brought England nearly to her knees, enemy leaders built a network of sub-pens with 12-foot concrete roofs that could withstand even a direct bomb hit. They launched new and more capable U-boats and developed battle tactics that seemed, at the time, almost invincible. By early 1942, America was supplying virtually all of the Western Front war effort. 
By torpedoing the transatlantic freighters, the enemy sought to cut Europe's Lend-Lease lifeline. They hunted in wolf packs, teaming up against even the most protected convoys. In the first half of 1942, enemy subs sank 506 Allied ships. Confronted with what was clearly a desperate emergency, the U.S. Navy called on the Army Air Forces to assist in the fight. Our long-range B-24s were the answer. We'd get out in front of the convoys, crisscrossing the ocean in search of subs. When we saw them, we went after them with depth bombs. They started crash diving when we flew over. We managed to sink a few, and it wasn't long before the Germans started looking for us instead of the convoys. Our exploding bombs helped clear the North Atlantic of the Nazi U-boat threat. June 1942, New York Harbor. Men of the 8th Air Force, 10,000 strong, prepare to board a single converted luxury liner for England, just as their fathers did a generation before in the AEF Aero Squadrons. The Royal Air Force, which had fought brilliantly in the Battle of Britain, set out to teach the Americans, and the Americans set out to learn. As well as the English and Americans got along at ground level, in the command post there was a basic disagreement on tactics. The AAF came over prepared for daylight precision bombing. The British, who had suffered catastrophic losses on day raids over occupied Europe, preferred bombing under the cover of darkness. Accordingly, the British Bomber Command picked their targets, trained their crews, fed them lots of carrots, and designed their planes for deadly night attacks. Our first test came August 17th. We loaded up for the first all-American bombing raid over Europe. The target was the Great Railroad Marshalling Yard near Rouen in Nazi-occupied France. The Brits were plenty skeptical. The Nazi gunners were battle-hard, and our morale had worn pretty thin from repeated dry runs and impatience for action. The guys played nonchalant, but we knew what was riding on this mission. We were out to prove the effectiveness of daylight high-altitude precision bombing. <laughs> Maybe we didn't know any better, but we had plenty of confidence. Confidence enough that at the controls of one of the lead ships was the old man himself, General Aker, flying a B-17 named Yankee Doodle. the city of Rouen. More than five centuries before, Joan of Arc had died there fighting for the liberation of France. Now a bunch of American kids in airplanes with names like Baby Doll and Peggy D were about to do the same. We made a direct run for a point about three miles north of Rouen and then a slight turn to starboard for the bombing approach. Visibility was excellent. All of us flying this first U.S. bomber raid wondered why the sky was clear of enemy fighters and flak. Turns out we'd taken the spotters by surprise. They were expecting only night attacks. Our 12 planes dropped a total of 37,000 pounds of bombs. Then the flak came up to meet us. Daylight gave the Germans better targets, too. Forty German fighters made the picture complete. These weren't targets towed behind C-47s. These babies shot back. When we finally shook off the enemy attack, I took a reading. Incredibly, our group was intact. No planes down. 
At British Bomber Command, Air Chief Marshal Harris sent General Laker enthusiastic congratulations. Yankee Doodle, he said, certainly went to town and can stick another well-deserved feather in his cap. November 8, 1942, the Mediterranean. 11 months after Pearl Harbor, more than 800 ships engaged in Operation Torch, the Allied invasion of North Africa. The plan called for tactical air support for the ground forces. Some of the air units were ferried to England from the States by aircraft carriers. Now inspired by Doolittle's Tokyo raid, land-trained fighter pilots, because their planes were urgently needed, risked the carrier takeoffs to get to Morocco. We had 70 P-40 Warhawks on a U.S. flat top, 25 more on a British carrier. We liked this plane. It was both a fighter and a bomber, and could carry a 500-pound bomb as easily as it could a belly gas tank. At two and three minute intervals, we raced down the short deck and grabbed for air. <laughs> Felt like somebody pulled the runway out from under us awfully fast. We cleared the decks and buzzed the carriers for luck. Then the entire group headed for the already battle-scarred landing fields of French Morocco. Allied forces had rolled over the opposition and moved halfway across North Africa only to grind to a halt because of weather and a lack of supplies. The Allies were almost within sight of the enemy's big supply forts in Tunisia. However, logistics and mud dictated the decision. At General Eisenhower's order, the attack was postponed indefinitely. The mountains, the roads, even the air seemed to ooze from six weeks of steady rain. Nothing moved on the roads. On the temporary airfields, wheels went no place. Only a few meager supplies trickled through. For once, like the foot soldier, air support, the umbrella for our ground forces, was stuck in the mud. The enemy was in much better shape. They had hundreds of planes operating from permanent all-weather fields. Their veteran, battle-trained Luftwaffe was sure of easy victory over crippled American air units. Allied harbors and airfields were primary targets. Air defenses were weak, open to enemy dive bombing and strafing. After plastering Allied supply harbors, the Nazis went after the airfields. The ground seemed to rise and burn under repeated attacks. The Allies suffered huge losses, and as they rescued their wounded, new and faster ways were improvised to carry casualties to safety. The planes, which had brought in high-priority supplies, took out higher-priority men. With air evacuation, casualties were only hours from hospitals that might be days away on the ground. The brass was helping us get on even terms with the Luftwaffe. The Army transport boys took over entire railroads to keep us supplied. A while back, we'd nearly run out of 500 pounders, but now we had plenty. Gasoline rationed at home gave us mobility in the desert. The battle for supply was being won. On February 14th, Rommel's Africa Corps attacked at Kasserine Pass. After eight days, the Axis initiative was exhausted. Rommel quit his African command and returned to the fatherland. The Axis still had a trump card. The Africa Corps blocked the way to Tunis. The Allies froze, seeking weak spots, shifting forces, and building for a breakthrough. On the morning of May 6, they called for tactical air support. Weather was good. We had gasoline and fresh planes and men. The Northwest African Tactical Air Force drew up a schedule for an unprecedented wave of air attacks. They ordered us to concentrate on an area four miles long by three and a half miles wide. We had 12th Air Force bomber boys who had started in the muddy fields of Algeria. 
and they were teamed up with 9th Air Force men who had eaten sand all the way from Egypt, 1,500 miles. Before 9 o'clock, we had planned to fly more than 1,000 sorties. Anything that could take off, did. The armies were anxious for the air attack, which would mean a breakthrough. They didn't have long to wait. Resistance began to crack. In two hours, tanks and infantry had advanced as much as a mile. Germans, realizing their desperate situation, retreated to make a last ditch stand. Finally, our armies broke through. At last, the Allies could see Tunis. A year and a half after Pearl Harbor, only six months after the landing in North Africa, Allied soldiers, tankers, and airmen were feeling the first flush of victory. The citizens of Tunis cheered the crusade for freedom and now had a new champion, Allied air power. The Allies took a quarter of a million prisoners. In the German defeat, we learned the strength of joint unified command of the troops on the ground, coordinating with the planes in the air. Allied air power had destroyed enemy planes, guns, and ships, and that paved the way for the final destruction of the opposing forces on the ground. England, 1943. Barely one year after the first American raids over Fortress Europe, the 8th Bomber Command prepares for a new mission. The first raids were conducted by 12 B-17s. This one was to include 376. The growth in Allied power was a function of American industrial capacity. It was no coincidence that the 376 American planes, the product of factories in Seattle and Kansas, were going to bomb the industrial heartland of Nazi Germany. World War II was as much a war of industrial capability as it was of men and tanks and guns. The Allies often used small-scale attacks on military targets to distract the German Luftwaffe from larger-scale raids on factories and industrial transportation hubs. A bullet not manufactured, after all, is a bullet no one will ever have to duck. October 14, 1943. The targets were the aircraft factory at Rosenberg and the ball bearing plant at Schweinfurt. <laughs> we didn't dream that this day would be written in air history. The RAF was bombing Penamuta, site of a huge V-2 rocket factory. On the other side of the world, General Kenny's B-25s destroyed 200 Japanese planes in eight minutes at Werak. Our double mission involved the deepest penetration ever attempted into Germany and the largest bomber force to be dispatched to date. We knew that as we went further into Germany, we'd hurt her more. But we also knew we'd have to pay a higher price for admission. In chapels all over England, men turned to their ministers, rabbis, or priests. Never had we prepared for so rough a mission. The AAF was still growing up. The Luftwaffe was at its peak. Four hours of rugged action lie ahead of us. 
Our guns were going to be especially important today. Fighters could take us about halfway, but they didn't have the range to follow us all the way in. Eighth air support mediums bombed diversionary targets, but for the worst part of the trip, we'd be on our own. Soon, 30 tons of bombs, planes, and men lifted off. The leader of the first wing swept in a huge circle around the field. Gradually, the second and third bombers edged into position. By the time the flying fortresses got into formation over the British field, they were picked up by German radar. Luftwaffe experts plotted the American course, altitude, and speed, and promptly informed their fighter control. Immediately, a dozen Nazi airdromes from Denmark in the north to Paris in the south began to send up everything they had. Flying in enemy territory, we felt like goldfish in a bowl. Strict radio silence was maintained. Trained eyes searched the sky for the fighters we knew would come. Germans knocked 20 bombers out of the sky on the flight to Schweinfurt, but we never broke formation. When the fortresses approached the bomb run, they divided into small groups. This limited their mutual defensive firepower, but meant the target could be bombed more efficiently. The crucial mission shifted to the steady hands of the bombardiers. The pilots would take no more evasive action until bombs away. The fortresses flew into the flak straight and level. tons of high explosives crushed the two main ball bearing plants. As soon as we felt the plane lurch upward as the bombs fell away, we could defend ourselves again. Mission accomplished. The main idea now was to get home and get there fast. There's nothing glamorous about the job. No victory rolls or ticker tape parades. But it was our little piece of history. No bearing from that plan ever became part of any Nazi tank or truck or aircraft engine. Sixty bomber crews had given their lives to make sure of that. The attacks on Germany's industrial base were designed to weaken the Reich in the long term, so that once the inevitable invasion of Europe took place, the Nazis would have less equipment, trucks and planes to fight with. Without those airstrikes, a much stronger Germany would likely have been able to repel the Allies before they got off the beaches of Normandy.
By June, three days before D-Day, enemy strength in Holland, Belgium, and France had been increased to 60 divisions. German headquarters knew an invasion was coming, but it wasn't sure where. Thinking the Allies intended to strike directly across the channel's narrowest point, the Nazis poured their limited resources into the Potoclay coast. Late on the afternoon before D-Day, Eisenhower, Spots, and Brearden came to the headquarters of the 101st Airborne Division. They visited with paratroopers who were about to be dropped in France. Soon after, a special broadcast brought all the massed military forces the final word. Soldier, you. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. The tide has turned. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. This was really it. Here we were, vaulting the channel, one British and two American divisions. Our mission, to drop troops behind German lines and create a two-front war. Those paratroopers were tough young men making, making history of their own. History which some of them would never get a chance to read. After softening up the Germans with millions of tons of high explosives, the AAF led the invasion charge across the channel. Behind and below the aircraft, hundreds of troop-laden invasion crafts were crossing toward the continent. At busy airfields from Devon to Lincolnshire, Allied aircraft marked with D-Day stripes loaded everything they could hold motorcycles, howitzers, jeeps, and armies of men. C-47 cargo planes ferried troop-carrying gliders across the channel, cut them loose, and returned for another load. Airplanes rolled off British fields to cover and directly support the Allied armies about to hit the beach. The timetable also called for planes to warn the free French, planes to distract the enemy, planes to smash German radar and communication, planes to attack rail centers, bridges and airfields. More than 8,000 planes dropped bombs to isolate the battle area from the rest of France. The boys on the ground had the hard job and we did everything we could to make it easier. We went in to demolish bridges so the Nazis couldn't reinforce. We smashed rail hubs so equipment that they expected would never arrive. By the end of the day, 74 tunnels and bridges leading to Normandy were put out of business. That bought the boys in the ground the breathing space they needed to build the beachhead. In Italy, far to the south of the D-Day action, an air siege was raging. Beginning in April, a constant campaign of bombing had been directed at the Adriatic port of Ploesti. Between 25 and 30 percent of the Nazis' gasoline production went on in the ten large refineries around Ploesti. Previous attacks damaged the refineries but had not destroyed them. Ploesti was one of the most defended places on Earth. In a raid in 1943, the Allies sent 177 bombers and 54 were knocked down before they got within sight of the city. They fought smoke, flak, and swarms of fighters. The Nazis knew how important Ploesti's oil was. They weren't going to lose it easily.
back at headquarters, they knew something had to be done. After so many missions, the target was still effectively protected. High-altitude bombing just wasn't working, so on 10 June, operations decided on a new tactic, dive bombing. They used P-38s, uh, fast little twin engines, that they figured could cut through the mess. above the flak on our way in, and some of us dumped our wing tanks. Then we headed down. We went for the refineries and anything else we could see. The tiny P-38s did what the huge bombers couldn't destroying 29 enemy planes and damaging three refineries. Operations increased around the clock. Bombers were on target during the morning hours to disrupt the Ploesti working day before it started. 600 planes at a time went in, always with fighters in the lead. Everyone hoped the sheer concentrated weight of explosives would crack the German defenses. Ploesti sort of got under everyone's skin. After hitting it from the air, we hashed it out on the ground. We ate it, slept it, cursed it, especially the flak and smoke. The four-month campaign since April had cost 1,900 men, the crews of 189 bombers and 41 fighters. But the refineries were still working, pumping oil to Hitler's tanks, and that had to stop. Early in August, General Twining called a meeting of our group commanders. We were going to make one final push. The Nazis put up more than 45,000 rounds of flak an hour. During three intense days, the Allies lost 30 more planes, 23 of them to the flak. But the attacks were having an effect. Enemy fighter strength declined precipitously. With the fighters gone, the Mustangs and P-38s shifted to ground attack. Backed up by the bombers, the steady pounding whittled away 90% of Romanian oil production. We hurt them, but they hurt us too. And we wondered about our missing air crews. How many would come back? The answer came sooner than we had expected. Twelve days after the last bombing of Ploesti, we got a real thrill. Romania had surrendered to the Russians, and word went out that the brass was organizing an airlift to bring back the flyers who'd been shot down and lived. In just three days, more than 1,100 returned. The brass called it Operation Reunion. It was the first mass prisoners of war liberation. But to us, it seemed like hundreds of our buddies had been brought back from the dead. General Twining made sure the men got medical care and some hot food. And then he bid them Godspeed on their next mission. Their new checkpoint was the Statue of Liberty. Their target was home.